J.R. Salzman, writer, blogger, veteran, lumberjack, ESP, uh, ESPY award winner uh, with us. J.R., thank you so much for your time, sir. Hey, thanks for having me on, Cam. You bet. Uh, I, I got to say, man, this was a, a fantastic takedown of the uh, Rolling Stone article, uh, The Gun Industry's Deadly Gun Addiction. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about this. We went over the first quote that you cited uh, that, that basically the, uh, the thinking is uh, the reason why the uh, AR platform and uh, modern sporting rifles are so popular is because we're, we're being force-fed these guns because um, uh, the customer base is too old, too white, too male, and too southern. We're, we're dying off, and so they got to get us hooked on new guns before we all drop dead from uh, eating sausage gravy, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a talking point, you know, took straight from the anti-tobacco <laughs> campaign. I mean, that's really the correlation they're trying to bring, that, uh, you know, that we're, we're all, it's, the guns are so deadly that they're killing all of us off, and we need to, uh, we need to keep being force-fed these guns, uh, you know, to, to keep up the population and to, uh, you know, to keep the, the Second Amendment crowd alive. You know, it's so utterly ludicrous that uh, they would draw these conclusions based on, you know, I'm sure as your uh, as the listeners know and as you know that uh, you know based on nothing whatsoever. I mean, it's just simply shameless, shameless demagoguery and. Uh, oh, it's yeah, it's, I mean, it's absurd. Just, I mean, like yeah. you know, this uh, much of the industry's recent success is linked to politics, in particular to the gun buying public's anxiety about the first black man in the White House. Um, no, I, I think it was the Chicago politician who has said throughout his entire political career that he wanted to do things like ban handguns that had gun owners concerned. Well, yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> when you go down here, when you go down the list of, uh, you know, reasons that they want to ban, you know, certain guns or certain type of guns, none of it really makes sense. And, uh, you know, especially the thing that I always hang up on as a, as a, as a combat veteran, as a former infantryman, I've shot uh, and have vast experience with actual machine guns. Right. I carried an M249 machine gun. In fact, I have a crack down the middle of one of my front teeth where I got hit in the mouth of the machine gun during training. <laughs> so, you know, I've got, some, I've got some pretty good experience. I had a, a M250 caliber machine gun on my Humvee that we rolled through Baghdad with escorting convoys. That's what was on my Humvee when I got blown up in Baghdad. So I know what military hardware is. The, the, the Bushmaster in my safe right now is not military hardware. Okay, right. it's not it's not the Colt that I carried in Iraq that had the the burst setting. You know that we would uh, we'd go out and you know run a lot of rounds through downrange or shoot tracers or warning shots. You know they're not the same, and I'm not sure they keep trying to uh, basically fear monger. And like I said, you know it's just basically shameless demagoguery. Because the point is, if they tell the truth about the stuff, they know they're not going to win the argument. That's why you know it's, it's basically twofold. They're going to be dishonest, or they're going to they're going to go the emotional route and say. You know, well, what about the children? What about the children? They don't want to talk about statistics. They don't want to talk about facts. They don't, don't want to talk about the fact that more guns equals less crime, you know, as John Lott has famously said. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you go down the list, you, you have to realize the context of how they're trying to shape the argument. They want to have an emotional debate. They want to rip your heart out. They don't want to discuss the fact that, you know, there are women out there who defend themselves from rape every single day by carrying a firearm. They don't want to discuss the fact that the president's kids are protected by guns every day. You know, they don't want to talk about these facts. They want to talk, they just want to keep saying, well, what about the kids? What about the kids? So I say, great, let's talk about those kids and let's talk about how we can keep them safe within the confines of gun rights and using the Second Amendment. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I've always said, uh, every time I hear President Obama or, or, or Vice President Biden or anybody say uh, that these guns are battlefield weapons of war, I, my reaction is, you know, God help us if we ever... Uh, equip our military with semi-automatic firearms and send them off to battle. I mean, that that would just be uh, that would be unconscionable. Uh, I mean, that that's that's how how different these firearms are. You know, so let's talk about the the uh, as you say the five main points that they say um, uh, the industry is doing to to try to uh, you know suck the lifeblood out of America, hook the kids. Uh, so, like things like what JROTC four eight shooting sports, youth shooting sports leagues that th th those are all uh, uh, what the the gun industry attempt uh, or the equivalent of like Joe Camel trying to hook kids to smoke. Yeah, and like I said, it's like I said in my in my piece that I wrote. I, I 
I can't really tell if this is a bit of just progressive revisionism where they try and pretend that the youth have not always been involved in hunting and shooting. I mean, I've got, like my father used to tell me stories all the time of how when they got home from school, the first thing they did was grab the twenty two and go out in the woods and, uh, you know, and hunt squirrels. And, uh, you know, when I, when I grew up, I, I learned to shoot a Ruger twenty two at the local range when I was just eight years old. Um, by the time I got to age 12, you know, I took hunter safety here in Wisconsin. I was out deer hunting. In fact, I started deer hunting at age 10. Uh, you know, I couldn't carry a gun yet, but, uh, I should say, I actually have three sisters, two of them also deer hunted, uh, when they were 12 years old. In fact, I remember my, my 12 year old sister, the one year she shot two deer. And, uh, I remember someone, someone asked her, she's, you know, uh, well, why did you shoot two deer? And she said, well, I would have shot more, but I ran out of bullets. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, a 12-year-old girl. And, uh, you know, I took, I took a sharpshooter's class. You know, the whole point is that they're trying to somehow make this moral equation that somehow teaching and educating youth about guns is, is a sin, you know. And I, listen, uh, I, JR, I'm telling you, you know, we, 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 I grew up in the suburbs. Uh, and I've only lived in the city. And then in December, I moved my family out to a, a small 40-acre farm. And one of, the, one of the first things we did was find the place where we were going to go shoot. And I, I talked to uh, the county sheriff, and I said, okay, so what are the ordinances? And he said, well, the noise ordinance kicks in at 11. That's basically it. And I said, well, that's fantastic. And so every weekend, we're, we're out there, whether it's with the 22, whether it's with, you know, the uh, shotgun, whether it's even if it's just the BB gun. Mm-hmm. I, I've got my, my 7-year-olds. Uh, are out there shooting. We're going to be uh, spring turkey season starts next month. I, uh, you know, absolutely. I, I mean, I, and and I'm a I'm just astounded that anybody would think this would be a bad thing to to actually teach your kids how to be. Res- you know, this is part of the learning process. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not a parent so that I can make my seven year old the best seven year old. I'm making I'm a parent so that I can make my seven year old eventually the, the best adult that they can be. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Because, you know, like I said, as you and I were brought up, you know, we realized that, that guns are something to be respected. They're not something to be feared. You know, they're not something, right. they're, they're not going to hop up and load themselves and, you know, take the safety off and shoot themselves. But, you know, but, but when you look at it through the lens that they're looking through it, you know, it's a, it's, it's a great way for them to try and, you know, breed this anti-gun culture because ignorance breeds intolerance. You know, and as I said in my, in my piece, you know, it's a lot easier to, convince people to join the anti-gun crusade when when they don't know the difference between a machine gun or a semi-automatic they think a clip and a magazine are the same thing uh-huh. or they think handguns are held sideways like gangbangers right you know? I, uh, did they did they get into i mean did they talk about the the benefits of no they would not have talked about the benefits no, of no, the they, they, that, that would be like honest that, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then uh marketing to children uh, and again, I would note that there are high schools all around the country. If you go down to the basements, there are rifle ranges from the 1950s and 60s because there used to be rifle teams that would shoot in the basements in the 1950s and 60s. But somehow they weren't marketing to kids back then. Um, so we got the kids and we got we got women, right? Because now they're they're going after the ladies. Yes, absolutely. You know, they they try to. Uh... Yeah, again, you know, they just sort of pulled a statistic out of thin air, and they said, well, just 15% of women own a uh, gun nationwide. Well, actually, they are the fastest-growing demographic. It's not 15%. It's nearly one quarter. And, uh, you know, a lot of women are realizing that uh, it's a great equalizer uh, against a man of superior strength, you know, and that's, that's the harsh reality of, you know, biological differences. Obviously, a man, most men have superior strength, but you know what? A, a gun is a great equalizer for that. But... You know, unfortunately, as we've seen in Colorado um, and elsewhere in the country, that uh, on the sort of on the liberal hierarchy of agendas, um, anti-gun trumps, uh, you know, empowering women. So they have actually gone so far as to say, and uh, as other people have heard around the country, they've said that uh, uh, women are not capable of handling a gun or properly defending themselves, or they're not smart enough to know when they might be raped, uh, and they're better off with a rape whistle or a call box. Um, you know, apparently they've never heard the, uh, the harrowing tale of uh, survival from Amanda Collins, who was raped with a call box over her head less than, you know, 50 feet from a closed campus police office. Yeah. You, know? you know, the sad thing is they have heard her. They've, they've, they've sat there and they've listened to her and they've said things like, you know, the statistics just don't bear out what you're saying, Amanda. Yeah. We, that we, I mean, that again, it's just mind boggling. Absolutely. In the uh, the rep, uh, and I can't remember if it was a senator or a rep in Colorado uh, who said that, is since 
you know, walk back on her rhetoric on that. I mean, what kind of a person would, would say that to a uh, face-to-face to a rape victim? And that, Because she said the stats weren't on her side. Well, the truth is the stats were on her side. You know, she said, well, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of like 1% of uh, times when a woman is, tries to defend herself with a gun against rape is the gun taken away. More often than not, you know, vastly, uh, the vast majority of the time a woman successfully uses a gun to defend herself. So, you know, it's crazy to me that they'll sit here and say, well, if it saves one kid or if it saves one life, well, if it saves one woman from being raped, is it not worth it? One would, uh, one would think. Uh, yeah, that, but, that's my logic, but you know, I'm, I, I guess I'm not drinking the same Kool Aid. So, yeah, I know uh, it's just bizarre. So then the uh, oh, the other thing is they they complain about shooting ranges, uh, you know, now using interactive targets and things like that. Again, modernizing, growing, uh, changing with the times. Yeah, this, this is the crowd that has abided by the <laughs> the motto: "If it feels good, do it." Right. And yet now they suddenly have this anti-fun agenda, as if some, shooting something other than pop cans and bottles or just you know flat bullseyes is uh, it's it, it shouldn't be allowed. You know they're trying to make this video game equation because let's face it, going to the range is fun, but you like to mix it up once in a while. You like to shoot something other than the tree, or uh, you know you want you want to shoot something other than the uh, you know a target down range at a hundred yards. So. That's what it's about, you know, if you can bring your kids out and have fun. But, uh, you know, for them to try and make the, the anti-fun argument, uh, you know, like I said, apparently it's supposed to be as unpleasant as the listening to Green Day or reading the politics section of Rolling Stone because it's just <laughs> it's just so utterly mind-blowing for them to try and make. Going to the range should be like going to the DMV. You should just have to sit there for like an hour and a half and then some grumpy person says, okay, lane 15, and then, you know, you go, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they were. Yeah, I think even they acknowledged they were probably reaching a little bit on that argument. But uh, so then we have uh, uh, prep the preppers. Oh, and then the last one: uh, supply cartels and criminals. So, so we've got the uh, the the, the uh, they're anti prepper. Yeah. So we've got the anti prepper argument, and this kind of goes back to the. Uh, uh, I think, in my opinion, the liberal mindset that you don't need a gun to defend yourself. That's what police are for. You don't need to stockpile, you know, food and supplies. You know, that's what the government is for. Well, as a journalist, uh, I covered Hurricane Sandy. I was actually on the ground out on Rockaway on on Election Day, you know, and I saw the effects firsthand of this, you know, the gun-free utopia of Bloomberg's New, New York. I mean, there were there were signs. Uh, in, in the yards of some of these homes, it said, if you loot, we shoot. You know, because the reality was uh, Bloomberg did not want to let the National Guard in to help the overwhelmed NYPD in the aftermath because they had guns, and he said he did not want to turn it into a police state. I mean, I can't think of a more ridiculous argument to make. So, you know, here you had these people who were basically, uh, you know, left to fend for themselves. So I asked this one gentleman, he was a union plumber, in, uh, you know, been working at the World Trade Center, and I asked him about a sign. He said, yeah, he goes, and I mean it, too. I've got a shotgun right inside the door. So these are people who basically were left, you know, by Nanny Bloomberg to, to defend themselves, you know, in, in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. Right. Uh, because he, he, couldn't, he couldn't, you know, his, his anti-gun agenda trumped helping these people out, helping the citizens of New York. So, you know, for, for, uh, for Rolling Stone to say that, you know, you don't need a, these preppers are nuts, they don't need guns. Well, that's utterly ludicrous. I mean, look, look at the L.A. riots. You had shopkeepers who were using AK-47s to, uh, to defend their businesses. I mean, it's every single day citizens use guns to defend themselves. So, again, to, uh, to make this argument that uh, you don't need a gun in case of societal collapse or, or just, you know, societal disarray, you know, again, I guess it's, uh, you know, Rolling Stone headquarters in midtown Manhattan, so I guess it's pretty easy for them to uh, sit up there high and dry and preach to the people who were freezing their butt off on Election Day out on Far Rockaway. Yeah, no kidding. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's funny, Jr. they always, and now, of course, you had Bloomberg say, well, we didn't have any of this. But remember, he didn't even want the National Guard coming in. I mean, it really was just a matter of he doesn't think anybody uh, should be able to defend themselves, just rely on that phone, even if it's not working. Uh, and, and otherwise, uh, you know, just like uh, James O'Keefe and his investigators uh, uh, heard so many times uh, as they were talking to cops in uh, and around the New York area, you're on your own. Um, and, and on a good day, it may be eight, nine, ten minutes if you live in the suburbs or in the city. But, uh, you know, in a situation like that, who knows how long it can be? 
Um, well, sorry. So the so the <laughs> last uh, uh, thing that they say the uh, uh, evil gun industry is doing, they say that they're outright uh, supplying cartels and criminals. Yeah, and uh, you know this, uh, like I said, in the wake of Operation Fast and Furious, I can't think of a more tone deaf argument to try and make. I mean, there was an operation by the administration to purposely allow the straw purchasing of guns from gum dealers, gum dealers who had objections to it, and, you know, allow them to be funneled into Mexico. I mean, it's obviously what's led to the death of Brian Terry and, uh, you know, countless Mexicans, you know, over the border. So to, uh, to try and, you know, apparently I guess they don't read the same news sources that we do because they apparently didn't even know it existed. You know, I, I can't imagine someone would make that argument if they knew it existed. But... Um, you know, furthermore, they, they keep, it's this, this statistic, it's this zombie statistic that just won't die, that 90% of the guns trafficked into Mexico originated from American manufacturers. I mean, the Governor, Government Accountability Office has said that that is false. It's, because when you look oh, at yeah. the numbers, it's, it's a percentage of a percentage of a percentage. You know, they were well, like, at first they said 90%, and then they went down to 80, and then they went down to 70, and then they went down to like 63 Right. But again, as you say, it is the percentage of the percentage because not every gun that is recovered is traced. Well, in actually, it boils down to, you know, 12 percent of the guns uh, recovered were traceable to the U.S., you know, not 87 or not 90 percent. And, you know, and just to be clear, obviously, it's, it's tragic any time that, uh, you know, a gun from the states is, uh, you know, found down there. And, uh, you know, but, but the harsh reality is, and as I said in my piece again, how can Rolling Stone be arguing? trying to make the argument that more gun laws equals less guns and less crime you know mexico is a place that has very strict anti-gun laws i mean look what happened to the uh, the marine who was simply thrown in jail and left to rot simply because he was trying to bring in an antique you know firearm across the border i mean he, he was thrown in jail for simply possessing it so how can they turn around and say that uh, you know by passing more laws, we're going to make the streets less safe. Well, no, that's that's not going to happen. I mean, look what's look what's happened down in Mexico. Absolutely. Listen, Jr. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Great piece, and uh, look forward to having you on again soon. Hey, thanks again. I appreciate it.